Hi everybody, it's Josh with Talk About Trek, and I'm back again this evening. Having finished up yesterday, Star Trek The Next Generation, Guises of the Mind. Uh, a very different novel, written by Rebecca Neeson, published in 1993, and um, I have to say, I, I did enjoy it. I enjoyed it so much, I was able to work through the book in just, uh, you know, four nights and maybe a couple of afternoons at it, and was very interested in the story, and was just kind of, uh, I don't know, invested, I guess, to see what was going to happen in the end. Saying that, it was one of the least Star trek -y books that I've ever read. Uh, being a Star Trek book. Like the amount of I don't know, science fiction, starships, that kind of thing uh, that you would typically expect from one of these books. It's just not there for this. Uh, but it does tell a very interesting story. And it does feature one of my favorite characters, Counselor Deanna Troy, uh, who plays a very big part in it. And it also gives a very... I guess, a, a look at, like, religion in the Star Trek world, which is something that's not covered too much. So, uh, it was a fun book. It definitely was different. And as I was reading it, I could kind of tell, like, it kind of like it read, like, a little bit different. And then in reading the book upon books, the book about books here, uh, I was able to find more about the author and learn more about the backstory. But let's jump right into the front here. The crew of the Starship Enterprise must prevent a ruthless dictator from taking over a planet. All right, that's somewhat the case. <clears throat> All right, guises of the mind. The world Capulon IV is finally ready to join the Federation after years of waiting. All that remains is the ruler's coronation and a routine signing of the final treaty. When the crew of the USS Enterprise and their passengers, a group of women from a religious order dedicated to helping the downtrodden, arrive for the event, they expect to find the world willing and happy to receive them. Instead, they encounter deceit and treachery. The crown prince, once excited and eager to join the Federation, now refuses to even speak with Captain Picard. Beaming into the surface in an attempt to work out the problem, Picard, Troy, and Mother Veronica, the abbess of the nuns, are drugged and captured. Now they must somehow escape the crowning if they cannot prevent it. The king will be omnipotent, with all the power to destroy the starship Enterprise, and all of Capulon IV as well. The power... Okay. That's a bad back. I'll just say that right out loud. That's a badly written back blurb. Because, like, giving away, like, the fact that they got drugged in the story kind of takes away, a, like, a fun part of it. You didn't really see that coming. And uh, they shouldn't have given that away on the back. And also, like, the dude never threatened the Enterprise whatsoever. Which was kind of like one of the, like, the funny parts about this book, I guess, was because... It seems that, like, the Enterprise, with its abilities, could have easily solved the problem if they had known what was going on. So, what was going on on Capulon 4 there? We spoiled most of it there on the back, but let's actually get into the, the real nitty-gritty of it here. So, getting down into it, they're on a dipl blah, 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 a diplomatic mission to Capulon 4. They've been hired to... Uh, not hired, but they've been asked to bring the little mothers, and there's two of these little mothers, Mother Veronica and uh, Mother, what's her name, who doesn't factor into the story whatsoever, uh, and they've been asked to ferry them to Capulon 4. And at Capulon 4, they are expected to sign a treaty to welcome the Capulonians into the Federation. So they are on their way there to do that, Everyone is fairly giddy. Uh, the story begins with a focus on Counselor Troy and her kind of latest counseling session, which didn't work out very well, uh, resulting in a crew member who was unable to work through his problems and had to leave the Enterprise. So she kind of 
starts out like on a downtrodden note, uh, not able to help this person. And uh, you can see that the book right there is going to kind of, you can, well, you hopefully can see that it's going to focus on, on her character a little bit more than anyone else. So they're on their way to Capulon 4, and it's about three weeks travel time to get there. Uh, so then they cut the story to Capulon 4, where you get to meet the, the young king, um, Joachim. Jesus, is that his name? Anyway, it's something like that. Joe Kim or Joe Kill. Uh, anyway, Joe Kim is a uh, he's a young king who is very forward thinking. Uh, the planet right now follows a lot of very old kind of arbitrary laws, and he wants to change these things. And a lot of them are like really bad too. Basically, they don't allow any twins, so any second child born has to be killed. Uh, no imperfections, no birth defects, anything like that in their society. So he would like to make some changes to that, uh, but apparently has kind of kept that only to himself and his lady. Uh, so what's happened is he's been betrayed by his chief counselor, Achilleer, and Achilleer has replaced him with dun-dun-dun his twin. <laughs> like, right? It's like this is like right out of like I don't know, man in the iron mask kind of thing. You know, you got the, the, the twin of the king coming in, the evil twin of the king uh, coming in to to take the place of the good king. And, of course, what do they do with the good king? They lock him away <laughs> down in the bottom of the dungeon. And this uh, this twin, this his name is... Uh, I don't think I ever really knew how to pronounce it perfectly correctly. But I believe it's uh, Biorim. We'll call him Biorim. And uh, Biorim is, uh, he was basically saved from his fate, which would have been death, by a, a king's guard when he was younger and born, and then brought up, you know, a, in a life of kind of poverty. So he's a, a character who feels he's had his, this whole life of being a king taken away from him, and now he's been given this chance to take it all back. And they, they kind of hint later on in the book that he's the one that set this whole thing up, but initially they make it seem that this Acklear is the one who, who set up the whole thing. So they kind of switch back and forth between this story and the story on the Enterprise. Uh, back on the Enterprise, the crew is getting to know the little mothers, and in doing so, Counselor Troy finds out that Mother Veronica is telepathic. However, she is telepathic with no way to block no shields no defenses so she's never been taught how to um, shield her mind against other people's minds so counselor troy kind of takes it among her you know on herself to teach mother veronica that and mother, and her character mother veronica basically starts out at first just very very frightened very timid and um, very like not willing to to work to, to solve this, you know? And almost just like she wants to just go back to where she was, to where things were quiet, you know, in her mind. And they give you a little bit of backstory about how she was abandoned as a child because she had this gift and the planet she was on uh, basically killed people that had this kind of gift. And uh, she was given over to the little mothers and raised by the little mothers. But since she had lived with just them and their kind of peaceful minds and thoughts, it hadn't been a problem. But as soon as she got on the Enterprise and onto this mission, now she can't handle all these additional thoughts. So the, the story there, kind of going to the planet, is Troy teaching her these way to raise these shields and to block all of this from all these thoughts from, from constantly bothering her. Uh, back on Capulon, you get like a few more scenes down in the prison there where um, Biorum confronts Joe Kim and kind of like just gives him a little bit more information, kind of villain exposition about, you know, I feel this is my right now to do this. And then uh, also learns from his counselor, Achilleer, that his reason for his betrayal was that he had a daughter that was born with some kind of birth defect that he had to, to give up to death. So he was doing this to get the law changed. See, if only they had talked to each other, 
none of this would have happened, right? They, they, they both had the same goal, but uh, just just didn't speak up about it. So uh, they give you a little bit of a, maybe I'll call like a C or D story of data on the Enterprise, kind of intrigued uh, with his constant study of humanity, now of religion. And he's ask, he's going around, he's asking different people their thoughts on religion and the afterlife and that kind of stuff. And it gives a few different interesting moments when he speaks with Worf, with Geordi. Um, so I, d I like that little sea story. It was a good little kind of fill-in to this. See, it's, it is a very strangely kind of paced and laid out story. But I think that the author did such a good job with it that all the little threads kind of kept me interested going all the way through. It's about this time in the story we meet Elena, Elena, who is the uh, basically the love of the king, the love of Joe Kim. She is a like a priestess in the temple and has to choose now between marrying Joe Kim and being like the queen or entering into this life of servitude for the temple. And she decides that she's going to marry Joe Kim and uh, she goes to meet him after she's kind of been in seclusion for a little bit. But of course, at this time, it's not Joe Kim, it's Bjorn. And as soon as she meets and kind of speaks with him, at, and at first she kind of knows something's off, but as soon as he kisses her, she knows immediately that something is wrong. And she tries to go tell, like, the chief priest that something's wrong, and basically everyone's just kind of being like, you know, the king has got a lot on his plate right now with the upcoming coronation. You're just being a little too dramatic. I'm sure everything is fine. But literally, she's like the only one who, who knows that something is going on. So uh, at this point, uh, they go back to the Enterprise. Picard hails the planet. And uh, they now they're talking instead of to joke him to Bjorum. And they realize, too, that something is wrong. Bjorn has decided to move up the timetable and like the coronation and everything's going to be happening quicker. And he even indicates that he's thinking of not going ahead with the, the treaty with the Federation. So Picard and everyone on the ship is kind of worried about this and they decide they're going to increase their speed. Which, I guess the whole thing about speed in Star Trek is crazy because why wouldn't they just go at a faster speed anyway? <laughs> but I guess it's fine. Don't worry about that. Okay, so we're following along with the notes here just fine so far. Okay, so now we're at the point where Elena knows more about what's going on. And she's, again, the, the chief priest has told her basically just to kind of pray and contemplate. So that's what she's doing. She's in the temple doing that. And this is the point where they have a um, procession leading up to a vigil before the coronation of the king. So the vigil is just... Uh, Bjorum and his first counselor, Achalir, but Elena, who was in the temple, has kind of hidden herself away up there in the balcony so that she can learn the whole truth, you know, just like kind of perfect, lays it along perfectly for you, right? Uh, so, oh man, okay. So she learns that, I mean, they're basically down there. This guy, like, has no tact, this Bjorum. Even though he's supposed to be pretending to be the king on a vigil, he goes and he kind of sits down he puts his feet up, and he's just kind of like talking about the whole plan with his first, first counselor there. So Elena now knows the full truth and the full story, but doesn't know what to do with it. So uh, down on the planet, they finally, or the Enterprise finally gets to the planet the, the next day, and they beam down with uh, Captain Picard much to Riker's argument, uh, Counselor Troy and Mother Veronica. They beam down to, to meet with the king. Uh, the king is kind of pushing them off, and he's like got a lot to do that day. So he meets briefly with them before he kind of pushes them off to quarters and says, we'll feed you a nice meal, and then we'll speak again tomorrow about everything. Okay, so it's at this point where my notes fall apart of it. So we're just going to go a little freehand and see what happens here. Uh, this is where you almost have to kind of suspend your disbelief, where it's if the crew were acting as if you know that they really would have, 
none of these things would have happened for real. Well, oh my God, the doc misses you. Okay, we're back. Anyway, okay, uh, we're back. Uh, the king drugs Captain Picard, Counselor Troy, and Mother Veronica. He puts some drugs in their in their wine, and when they go enjoy their evening meal, and they're not at all suspicious, which I think maybe they ought to be a little. That's fine. Just suspend your disbelief. They they take the they drink the wine, and they're all drugged. And when they're drugged, they all basically just get uh, carried downstairs, and they all get lock, locked up into the same cell with the king. Even though they do indicate that there are several more cells in the dungeon, they decide to put all their prisoners into the one cell to make it easier for them to possibly plan escapes or anything like that. Anyway, <laughs> again, you have to somehow just kind of just go past that, just go along with the story, because it is good. So now they are down in the cells with the king. So now they can get the full story exposition on Capulon and what's really like going on with this planet, which is what you get at this point, which is uh, another very interesting kind of aside that they give you. But the planet of Capulon years ago was highly like technically advanced. And even though they don't look like it much now, they were incredibly technically advanced. And then that led to immense years of warfare. Uh, warfare with weapons, warfare with more powerful weapons, and eventually warfare with the mind, where these they developed these incredible telepathic powers where they were able to control people, uh, command people to do whatever they wanted. Uh, and it became such a problem that Basically, and they nearly destroyed their whole population through this. And then over time, throughout these generations of mind wars, the population of the planet developed these kind of automatic mental shields that would be put up to protect themselves from mind assassins and mind control and all sorts of crazy stuff. So over generations, and they were saying something like 30 generations maybe, uh, this planet changed completely. And became a much more peaceful place. The whole mind gifts from God became like a thing of the past. And they became like a very like faith-oriented planet. Uh, just as with these very strict, crazy, like, perfection rules. As far as like their children and no twins and things like that. So they get the full lore dump right then and there. So they now know the whole story. And they know the whole story of how Biorum knock him out and took his place. So at this point, they have a few different ideas. Uh, the first thing they're going to try to do is that they realize that maybe uh, the king has this kind of psychic ability. So Mother Veronica and Counselor Troy are going to work together to unlock that and see if they can unlock that to somehow escape and get away. And that doesn't work. So that's their plan, and it basically does nothing. So... The <laughs> the captain and counselor Troy are useless in their cell. Uh, they're not able to do anything to affect their escape, unfortunately. Uh, but luckily, back on the Enterprise, Riker starts to finally know something is wrong. <laughs> and the very few scenes uh, do they give you. Maybe one or two uh, up on the Enterprise during this whole story where initially where they contact uh, they contact the planet the first time after they've not heard from the captain in the morning and the the chief counselor gets on the phone and is like well you know they're locked away they're in the vigil with the king they left their communicators in their room and it's like it's just plausible enough to be you know to to work and uh but Riker's like and he's still feeling, like, in the back of his head, he's like, no. And he's got this, like, mother hen feeling, you know. He's, he, something is wrong, and he's got to take care of it. So that's, like, the first scene that they give you with that. So then they go back to the uh, back to the planet again, where they kind of focus the story now, again, uh, a little bit differently, on this Elena and her kind of quest to do something now to, to right this situation. So she... You know, now she knows the full story. Uh, she has to... She follows uh, 
Phelan down, or not Phelan, but I think Acolier down to the dungeons and is able to find the door to the dungeon, but is not able to unlock it or anything. But speaks with uh, Joe Kill, and they have a Joe Kim, Joe Kill. I'm going to call them both things throughout this whole video, and that's fine. Uh, but anyway, they, they speak, and they exchange, you know, their, their sweet nothings and whatever through the, through the gate, and uh, they devise a plan where basically she needs to go and access the, the radio to somehow communicate with the Enterprise to get them down. That's, that's the plan. That's the best they came up with. It's a plan. Uh, so that's what they try. She goes up to the, the chief, uh, like the chief priest's office. He's the only one that has like a powerful enough radio to reach the Enterprise. Uh, she gets up there and of course has no idea how to work or turn on the, the radio itself. Uh, presses a few buttons, gets caught, gets locked in her room. Uh, at first she kind of despairs, but then she has hope and becomes like the heroine of the story at this point, basically saving the day. Climbs out her window, climbs around on a ledge, climbs down onto a roof, and just kind of, uh, she gets scraped up a little bit, a little bit bruised and bleeding. That's like the action of the story right there. That little climbing sequence was probably the most action that happens in the book. Uh, and she gets a little bit beat up by it, uh, but she's able to make it down and hide out and uh, is able to soon do something. Uh, back down in the dungeon, after realizing that there's not much they can do to release the king's inner power or whatever, uh, Captain Picard comes up with a plan to basically jump the next guy that comes in the door. And Counselor Troy says, well, let me try one more thing first. And she uh, uses her ability and her past with Commander Riker to reach out mentally to her Imzadi to uh, let him know that something is wrong. He should have did that from the beginning. Right? Am I right? Am I right? So anyway, she does that. She's able to do that. And then you get your next little scene with Commander Riker who is up on the, uh, I think up in the, in the conference room worried uh, and is starting to feel this kind of like tingle, this kind of something he knows something is wrong and then eventually over the course of like that couple next couple of pages it develops into what he knows is like a connection so now he knows he's being reached and he's like okay time is up and he looks at Worf and like this whole time Worf has been like well, come on let's do something and like uh, so that that's kind of a fun part too and like Worf let's get a security team is like all right finally you know all right so um, now they beam down to the previous location they don't attempt to really communicate with anybody and just kind of immediately start like searching around. Worf gets a lock onto the communicators. They find them in the, in the rooms, of course, attached to the clothes that they're not wearing anymore. But it's at this point when the away team luckily runs into Elena. Saving the day, right? So she guides them to the dungeons. Uh, before they reach the dungeons there, they have to run through the kitchens where they're spotted. And at this point, Worf is like, I'll hold him here. You guys make it to the dungeons. And like, they act like he's going to be like doing this last stand or whatever there, holding off the the, the big army of the Capulons as they, as they come running towards him. But not to be anyway. Anyway, they get down to the dungeons and he blasts open the door and they free everybody and they're able to get away and head back up the stairs there. I feel like I'm leaving something out. I bet I am. Anyway, they get back up the stairs. They come back up to the kitchen area where Worf is, uh, is basically the Worf and the security team are just kind of hanging out there saying, well, they tried to come through and one of them came through and I stunned him and then the rest ran away. And like basically all these dudes have is like batons. They don't even have any kind of <laughs> phasers or anything like that at all. So they, they quickly rush to the Grand Temple where the... Uh, the procession and the consecration and the coronation is taking place here for the false king. And they are able to make it there in time to stop right before they're like putting the crown on the guy's head. And when the two kings get there, of course, the, the council of elders and the chief priest decide that they have to stop everything right then and there so they can figure out the truth of the matter. And at this point where the king and Elena this is such a weird Star Trek book, right? But it's good. It's fine. The King and Elena proclaim the ancient rite of Richa, where they can use 
ancient mental powers to find out who the true and rightful king is. And the planet or the elders oppose because who has mental powers? Nobody does right now, except for Counselor Troy and Mother Veronica. Mother Veronica is afraid. She doesn't want to do this. She agrees at first, but then the pressure is too much, and she has to leave back to the planet. In the morning, Counselor Troy and her have to use their psychic powers on the king, on the two kings, and then determine who the rightful king is, basically, is the idea. Uh, but Mother Veronica has went back to the ship. We're luckily back on the ship. She has a nice little scene in the uh, ship's chapel with Data, who, in his own search for like an idea of faith and religion, has uh, been hanging out here in the chapel and talks to Mother Veronica about her crisis of faith that she's having. And through their little talk, Mother Veronica is able to turn her own thoughts around, which seem to happen a little quickly. Like, her character took, like, a very quick 180, but Data can do that to people, right? <laughs> I mean, a conversation with Data can change you. It would change me, right? So anyway, she she goes back to the planet at the last moment and comes in to proceed in the Richa ceremony to find out who the true and real king of Capulon is. So they go and they begin the ceremony, and they start with... Um, the bad guy, Bjorn, first, and they get into his mind and they're ordered to tell everything that's in there. So they tell all of the, the hatred and the evil that's in there. When they go to read the other king, they're unable to. And then that to the elders and the chiefs or whatever proclaims that he is the true king of Capulan and Bjorn is the, the false king. And the Rechan is over and Jokiel wins and he's crowned to be the king of Capulan. And that's kind of like the end of the drama in the book. It's expected now that he will execute his twin brother and the other um, accomplices there that, that were part of that crime. But he has a kind of heart-to-heart -heart with Captain Picard uh, later on, you know, that day at his coronation dinner. And in talking with him, and kind of... That was kind of another kind of fun part. Like, they see each other like as friends and like he's giving like just like advice as a friend to like this king, you know, who this king who for the rest of his life won't really have friends to talk to. It's always going to be advisors and, and servants and things like that, but not like a friend. So there he, he's able to talk to Jean-Luc as a friend. And Jean-Luc, I think, kind of influences him. And I think he even tells him the story of uh, Solomon with the two ladies and the baby. And... Uh, kind of a comparison to a story that he gets told earlier from Joe Kill, a similar story from one of their old kings. And is able to instill like a little bit of wisdom into him. And then later when they're doing like the, the king's first pronouncements and things, they pronounce what they're going to do. And he pronounces that he will not kill his brother-in-law. And he offers the, the participants either exile or, or you have to work with the little mothers to uh, to uh, make their facilities better, you know. Uh, so the brother and the uh, one of the other guys chooses exile, and then Akalir chooses to work with the little mothers because I mean that's kind of his goal in the first place is already accomplished. Again, if like he just talked to the king in the first place, things would have been accomplished, right? But he didn't. So, and, and that's kind of how the book ends, really. Uh, the king, of course, did uh, his first act. He abolished the rule about, you know, killing babies. You no know, killing the babies if they're twins or if they're imperfect. So no more of that. He kind of brings them out of that area. And also agrees to join the Federation. So the, the Capulonians there are the newest member of the Federation. So, yeah, like that's the end of the book. The, literally, like, the only action that took place in the book was the time that Bjorn punched his brother in the face and knocked him out. And then the, uh, I mean, the away team didn't even run into any action. And the action was entirely off the page. They just described it later. So it was uh, just a completely actionless book. Also, uh, no starships, 
Like not it was very a very not Star Trek Star Trek book. Man, went dark two times. I'm really talking for a while. But I think every ten minutes it shuts off. Uh, that being said, I'm fuzzy. Oh, I'm not fuzzy. Okay. It was a very good book. I enjoyed it so much that I, again, I was drawn to read it quickly. I read it in just a few nights. It was uh, 277 pages. And look at the write-up that you get in this here right here. Right? So, like, this whole two pages is all about the backstory of this book, which is so cool. That's, like, one of the things that I really love is being able to read a book and then you have some questions about it, like why, like why was it that way? Why was it written that way? There were some things about this book and like the way that that she wrote, that like made me think, like, well, this is just written in kind of a strange way, like a more, I don't know, I'm saying this wrong, a prosy way, like, but just the way she described things, uh, the way she wrote things was almost like kind of like describing things as if, if like from a poem. Uh, I'm saying that now because I know that she was a, a poet. But anyway, the backstory here is that uh, this book is a, kind of like a product of like years in the making. She was a initially just kind of like a like a letter writer and a poet, uh, Rebecca Neeson, and uh, also a fan of Star Trek. And then one of her friends convinced her to write a manuscript. So she wrote this manuscript for the TOS called The Gift of Silence. Uh, sent it in, and they were interested in it, but it wasn't quite what they were looking for at that time. So basically, they uh, they sent it back to her. But then she, uh, Dave Stern, who was the, uh, well, I think the person she was in contact with there, uh, eventually got back with her during the Next Generation time to talk about revisiting it. So, and then basically during that next kind of like period of years, she would rewrite the story, send it in, get corrections and notes, rewrite it again, send it in, get corrections and notes, rewrite it again, send it in, get corrections and notes, until they finally came up with the final guises of the mind, which, when I hear things like that, it makes me want to, like, I would love to see, like, the notes. I'm such a Star Trek nerd, I want to see the notes on the book. On the... <laughs> but seriously, it's interesting, though. It's interesting to me. Uh, and getting all that backstory made, I guess, made the whole story of the book more interesting as well. So this was her first piece of fiction that she ever wrote. And she never wrote another Star Trek book again, which I think is a shame, too, because I did like how she wrote, like, Counselor Troy's, like, mental, the, the, the mental telepathy and everything that was going on there, I think, was really well done. So it was just a very interesting very interesting book and then learning more about it in the end i think made it even more interesting in my mind again it's not the most star trek book ever but that's fine because it was interesting and it was fun and it featured counselor troy and you can't go wrong with that so yeah guises of the mind number 27 of the tng numbered series and I am most definitely going directly into... Yes. Oh, I am excited for this. I think I read this one as a kid. Here there be dragons. Uh, will be number 28. And next on my list to read here. Uh, getting ready to head out for a vacation, which will afford, hopefully, a lot more reading time. So if you guys have any suggestions for anything else to jump into during that time, uh, I already know first things first, I will be reading Ship of the Line, which I'm definitely looking forward to. But if you have any other ideas, definitely let me know. All right, we are going to call that one here. As always, thank you so much for watching, everybody. Live long and prosper, and we'll see you guys in the next one.